way you discipline a child under the age of three with toddlers is consistent corrective actions because they learn through repetition and only right in the moment. Okay. What should I do when my two-year-old screams and cries in the store when she's told, no, she can't have something? Um, well, she should be in a shopping cart, right? Actually, in my tantrum course, I have a whole section on supermarket tantrums and how you avoid them. Um, you might want to check that out. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. Is she in a cart? And do you sometimes give her stuff? This is the problem. Parents say, well, yeah, sometimes I buy them stuff. And I'm like, why would you do that? They don't understand why sometimes you'll buy them something and other times they don't. They have no concept of that. You don't look like a leader. You look like you don't know what you're doing. It's like, so sometimes I can have a treat and other times I can't. They don't understand that. It's inconsistent. And toddlers need consistency. So, yeah. Um, anyway, I had a, a, I had like a little shop, a supermarket, uh, like goodie bag. And it opened at the top like this. And inside, every time we went shopping, they went in that shopping cart. There's no way they were going to be loose ever. And never get them to help when you're supermarket shopping either or any kind of shopping. Because they don't understand why they can't put the eggs in the basket either. See what I'm saying? You're inconsistent. Well, you can do it with the Kleenex because you can't break it. A two-year-old does not understand that. Yeah, but I want to put the eggs in the back too. And the parents are all frustrated. You did that to them. You train them that sometimes they can do what they want and other times they can't. Like it's so inconsistent. So yeah, you usually train them to do that. How do you deal with a very clingy one-month-old, one-month-old, 12-month-old, has a very intense separation anxiety. Every parent thinks that their own kid's going through something intense. It's probably normal. A lot of them go through separation anxiety. It just takes time. It's just a stage. They're going to survive. It's usually harder on you than it is on them. What you do is I call it the dump and run. When you got to go somewhere, just do the quick dump and run. Say, you'll be okay. I'll see you later. And be all cheery and then walk off. So, And you can do some quick little trial runs and just make it short ones. But you don't come back until they've calmed down. Um, so that you might even be standing outside as soon as they calm down you can come back but don't make a big deal about the hello either don't make hello or goodbye a big deal just keep it real low key um, anyway that's how you deal with separation anxiety it is uh, very common by the way this one's good because I talk about under the age of three the way you discipline a child under the age of three with toddlers is consistent corrective actions because they learn through repetition and only right in the moment OK, so the question is, what is a good example of corrective actions I could start being consistent with? OK, so let's say they have a toy and they hit with that toy. You say no, you take that toy away, put it where they can see it, but put it away for a while, for an hour, for the rest of the day, whatever, depending on the age and all that. So you're taking something away that they used as a weapon is a really good one. If they're climbing on the couch, you say no and you put them down off the couch. OK, and every time they do that, you say no and then you distract them if they're really little. Um, but yeah, you just got to be consistent, corrective actions. And then a lot of parents are going to say, yeah, but they think it's a game. Not so much if you're playing, if you learn how to play with them, like in their world, they're going to play with you rather than climb on the couch. So you've got to divert, but it's a, it's a, it's a fine balance there. You can't say, okay, come on, let's go play. You say no, but then you might go over and start playing with Play-Doh or something. They'll probably come over and join you. So you got to teach them not just what not to do, but what to do. You got to give them another option. You got to set them up for success. So rather than failure, what to do when you get burnt out with repeating corrective actions with a two-year-old? Okay, it, it all I make it sound so simple, but there's a lot of little subtleties to it too. Like if all you're doing is corrective actions all day, it's not going to work. You got to mix it with a lot of play. And when you're playing with a child, you see. Okay, I'll tell you something. I uh, I never teach what I do because. I have my own style, but I know how to teach you how to get there a different way. Does it make sense? But I never teach what I do. When I was working with hundreds of kids, teenagers, toddlers, kids, and they were all challenging. I never got an easy, no one ever said, here's an easy one, Lisa. They all went, good luck with this one. So I always got the most difficult kids because I was good at dealing with kids. And I had no leverage. I couldn't do consistent corrective actions. I couldn't do media blackout. What was my power? Does anyone know, if you've watched me long enough, how did I get respect if I had no leverage? I couldn't discipline these kids. What was my power? And it's going to answer your question. What was my power from toddlers to teenagers? How did I get respect with all of them with no leverage, no discipline? How did I do it? If you've been watching me for a while, I'm not even going to answer that. Someone's going to know. What was my power with kids? How did I get respect so easily? Yeah, yeah there you go. It's all the same. It's playing. Their love language is fun and humor and playing 
and being enjoyed, my power was I was connecting with them and bonding with them. With little ones especially, I played with them. Uh, then I, as they got older, I used a lot of humor. And I always very clearly was in their world. I was there for them. And I worked it. I worked my butt off. I was there in their world for them. So it's playing fun as their love language. And the thing is, if they did something I didn't like, I would say, oh, not big on what you just did. I'll tell you what, we'll just stop this for a minute. And then I just go quiet. That was my, that was my punishment is I wasn't fun for a whole minute. Now you're going to say to me, I'm home. I live with these kids 24 seven. What do you expect me to be like a circus, circus juggler for 24 seven? No, but you balance it out. Play with them more. You'll find you're getting, you'll get more power that way. All my clients in coaching are shocked at that. You mean you're not disciplining your kid? All of a sudden, I'm supposed to be playing hide and seek every day? Yeah. That's part of it. We're balancing everything. That's part of it. That's it. That's the biggest part. That is your power, is your bond and your connection with your child is your superpower. And then we balance that out. You, you address bad behavior, but then you focus on the good kid. Now, you know I say that all the time. You do, you, I don't, I never ignore any bad behavior, but I don't focus on it. Where you put your energy and your focus is what grows. If you put all your energy and focus into their bad behavior, it will grow and grow and get worse and worse and worse, guaranteed. If you're always telling them what not to do, they'll get worse and worse and worse. What do you suggest about my 18-month-old hits my 12-year-old and laughs? Okay, that they're, at that age, they're consistent corrective actions. So the 12-year-old uh, can actually say, just say no and hold their hand and look at them seriously and then walk away. That's what you do too. You intervene whenever you can. You take charge of that. But if you're not around and you're 12, you just say no and you hold the hand and then you look away. Avoid all I come. You, you say no. You hold their hand as soon as they hit. You say no. And then you look away while you're still holding them just for a few seconds. Then calmly let go. If they go for it again, say no again. And then I would probably walk away after two or three times. They'll eventually learn. Uh, Two-year-old tantrum in floor in public, pick them up or ignore if they're safe. If they're safe, oh, I just ignore them. I just stand there filing my nails, waiting, waiting. Never look at them or talk to them. You're feeding it. Any attention, including eye contact, any attention is feeding it. You're fertilizing it. And it'll grow and grow and grow. Just let them run it out. The thing is, they're used to you not, not doing that. So they're going to get worse before they get better. Because they remember the old you. Come on, I love you. Or whatever you were doing, right? I don't mean to mock you like that. But <laughs> Come on. <laughs> But you get the idea. If you weren't a leader before and all of a sudden you're doing all these leadership things, kids are often going to test you to see if you really know what you're doing and they remember the old you. So yeah, just ignore it. And then as soon as it stops, you ignore the crazy and then you reward the calm with attention. Say, y'all done? Okay, let's go. And don't discuss it. You never discuss a tantrum before, during, or after. I had a, a lot of my clients are teachers, principals, and child psychologists because parenting is a specialty. It's different. Uh, I couldn't do their jobs and they struggle with parenting like anybody else. Um, so, but anyway, and they'll sometimes argue with me about that. They say, but shouldn't you be discussing like psychologists will, uh, child psychologists will say, shouldn't you be discussing the tantrum and what happened? And I said, give me one good reason why not one of them's ever come up with a good enough reason, not something I can always rebuff it. Uh, what is the point in discussing a tantrum? What would be the point? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. 18 month old girl, super, super clingy. Oops. Uh, besides me or my husband, she refuses to go to others. Yeah, they're going to outgrow that. They're going to go through stage after stage after stage. They're going to learn. You know, you're going to end up dropping them off somewhere. My kids learned young because I dropped them off. As soon as they were up on their feet and not just wobbling, um, I went to the gym every day with them. So every morning they went in the gym daycare. That was their social club. They were only there for an hour. Um, and well, it depends. I made a lot of friends there. So we walked really slow back to the daycare. <laughs> The daycare ladies used to laugh and they said, how come the class ended an hour ago and you just got here? <laughs> Boy, did we walk slow down that hallway. But as the kids got older, they were having fun anyway. But yeah, they get used to it. They're going to cry at first with separation anxiety, but they'll survive. My parents adopted my sister's baby daughter right after she was born because of sister's addiction. What age shall we tell her? And what? Should we oh my God. You tell her ASAP. You were chosen. You're special. So yeah, we didn't have you, but we're so glad that you're here. Uh, your mom is so and so, but she's just she does the best she can, but she can't mom she can't be a mom right now. She loves you though, but we are so lucky we have you. So yeah, you tell them right away. I was adopted, so that's how I know. Guaranteed secrets imply shame. And my mom always told me I was selected, I was chosen, I was special. 
And then I was convinced that all other kids were just had, and I was the lucky one. And then she had to sort of, all the neighborhood kids' moms were calling her, Lillian, can you please tell your daughter to stop telling our kids they were just had, that they're special too? <laughs> I was convinced that being adopted made me more special than all the other kids. So yeah, I, I, always, I grew up with that, that I was adopted and I loved it. Never had any issues around it at all. I loved it. So yeah, secrets and plushing. Uh, what's the alternative to, to diversion? Can you explain? So I hate timeout, can't stand timeout. I think it's humiliating. There's no lesson learned. They sit in the corner and feel like crap about themselves. That's all. That's There's no lesson learned with timeout. Hate diversion. They're doing something bad. You divert them with, here's a treat for doing that bad thing. And the worst one is the countdown. If you don't stop that in three counts, there's going to be trouble, Mr. One, one and a half. It's fearful parenting. They pick up on their in charge. And uh, yeah, you're condoning the, the bad act for uh, the short term. So what you do instead, of, at the age of three and above, you use the behavior board and you put rules and consequences. You're on there too. That's what makes a leader is also accountable because they're not listening to you. They're watching you. So that's three and above. Under the age of three, they're consistent corrective actions right in the moment. I would never say something like, if you do that again, there's going to be trouble, mister. So in other words, it's okay to do it once. I'd say, I uh, shouldn't have done that. That's going away now. Like I take action like that got to be really fast they got to be able to connect the the what they just did in your action it's got to be fast with toddlers and they learn through repetition the first they're just going to kick and scream and all that and that's okay that's their process that's how they're learning a uh, two-year-old plays rough in daycare pushing kids and throwing toys you cannot discipline a child a two-year-old under the age of three from afar it's impossible i've never seen how you can do it um because they need to be right in the moment they they're in the moment discipline like right Consistent corrective actions in the moment. So I don't know how you would do that. Um, but if you're a leader at home, that very rarely happens. Work on your leadership skills. Are they ruling the roost at home? That's more likely to happen if they are. So work on your leadership skills. Don't let them get away with stuff at home. What do you mean by diversion? Diversion is when a child's doing something naughty and you go, here's some candy over here. Here's some ice cream. Because no one ever diverts with broccoli. It's always a reward. They're doing something rotten. You could, they get ice cream for it. What you just taught them is hitting the dog gets ice cream. So next time they're going to go, oh, I'd really like some ice cream. I know I'll go hit the dog because that's what it leads to. It's a reward. My two and a half year old didn't put away blocks when asked. So I ignored. And if she asked for something, I used the as soon as method. <laughs> Good for you. I love that method. Isn't that brilliant? You don't even have to tell. That's why I never told my kids what to do. People used to say, how come your kids are so good? And I said, what do you, how do you, you no, know, they just do they just do whatever you say. And I said, I never really tell them what to do. But I use the as soon as method. And then they just were self-disciplined. They just would never have asked for anything. They knew if they wanted a snack or they wanted to watch TV or wanted to go in the pool, they knew they had to do it, do their chores first or homework first. They just automatically did it on their own. So I taught them that when they were little. Good for you, Jennifer. Uh, two-year-old runs away, put them a harness, put a harness on them before you go out. And as soon as they start to take off, you say, you don't do that, clip, put them in. And you keep them clipped into that leash for the rest of that outing. So I would suggest you practice on some little outings that don't matter. Okay. Do it there first. And then they'll learn eventually. They're going to have a fit when that first happens. Yeah. That's the lesson that the, behind every fit scene or a tantrum is a lesson. You've got to be willing to embrace that. I embrace those. I'm like, come on, have a fit scene or a tantrum. I know what I'm doing. I know that's your process in hearing the word no and not getting what you want, when you want, how you want it. You're learning. That's their process. Don't interrupt it. Uh, I won't quit climbing. Okay, climbing is one of the four traits that they're born to do. They're either going to do them or they're never going to do them. One is climbing. One is hitting. Another one is running. They take off and don't even look to see where you are. They have no fear. And the other one is tantrums. With climbers, what I recommend you do is childproof your home as much as possible. Of course, you've already done that. And you're thinking, yes, yeah, stupid Lisa. Anyway, also put bells and alarms on everything that they use to climb. Um, so, and even put the bell on the kid if you have to. Put something on. You have to have a sound, something that lets you know they're going to climb. But yeah, good luck with that. It's a tricky one. That's actually my worst. That's my the one I hate the most. If I had a kid that was a climber, that would be the scariest one because it's dangerous. With runners, you can clip them into a harness. With climbers at home, they're on top of a fridge the next thing you know. How the heck do you deal with that? That's a tough one. That scares me the most because I think they can. it can be the most dangerous one. These are my top five tips for parenting toddlers. Number one, childproof your home so you never have to say no. Number two is you set up a toy rotation system so they're never bored. Number three is when you want to connect with a toddler. Now, when I say toddler, they're under the age of three. You enter their world. 
watch how they play and join in. Don't expect them to join in and do your adult stuff. Don't go to the nail salon with a two-year-old. You go to the park and roll down the hill with them. They just start to look at you differently. They just do. When you enter their world, they just feel more connected to you. And it's part of your leadership skills it's because their love language is fun. Um, and number four, it's kind of similar. You discipline in their world and they look at you differently when you discipline in their world. They're not about words. They're not about these mini therapy sessions that are so trendy now, but they're garbage. Let's discuss your big feelings and big emotions. That's garbage. That was invented for the mom. It's not for the toddler at all. It's not for them at all. Uh, they need consistent corrective actions right in the moment because they learn through repetition. They're not listening to you. They're watching you. Okay. Number five is stop trying to figure them out. Toddlers are not figure outable because they're not there yet. They're just developing sanity. That's why they're so crazy. They're cute as a button, but they're all feet, no brains. Imagine being two years old. And for one of those years, you were a potato laying on a mattress. Like they're just brand new. One, one marble and some tumbleweed floating around in there. They are not figure outable. They might even do this and might poop all over the wall. Can you figure that one out? No, I can't anyway. I'm going to look on YouTube now. Uh, my toddler screeches when she doesn't get what she wants. It drives me crazy. I'm working very hard on my patients. But this gets me every time. If they're screeching, I would just sort of, I wouldn't look at her, but I would just sort of go, oh, okay. And I'd wander off as if you're just sort of dazed. Oh, okay. Well, it's a message that screeching isn't going to work. Then when she stops screeching and she's nice, I'd go back and then I'd give her some attention. You ignore the crazy and reward the calm. So, but you got to be subtle about it. You can't look like, oh, I'm leaving you now. Like, you can't look like that. It has to be like, oh, you just sort of wander off as if you're just sort of looking at the birds and the trees, like that kind of, you know, wander off. And then when she stops screeching, you can go back and say, oh, do you want to read a book? And offer something calm. She screeches again, just get up and wander off. Calm as anything. It's a slow burn process. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, when you say children's love language is fun, what age does this apply to? Uh, probably about three months old. Yeah, it's all cuddling and fun and a lot of affection and laughing. And that's their love language. A lot of smiling. I remember the first year of my son's life, my jaw was killing me. And I went to the doctor and I, I said, I don't know what's happening. And then he sent me to a dentist and I figured it out. I was smiling for that whole first year at my son. Ah, you know, Because he was smiling back at me and it was just, and still now thinking about it, my jaw hurts. But I was just smiling. That's their love language. It's just fun and smiling and all that stuff. Right from day one, virtually. He, he smiled really young. Uh, he was under three weeks old when I got real smiles out of him. And uh, But yeah, it was just constantly looking at him, smiling and talking like that. And Yeah, I loved it. So that's their love language. Do you use timeout? Oh, you must be new. I hate timeout. Can't stand timeout. I hate it. I think it's humiliating. Teaches them nothing but how to feel like crap when they're sitting by themselves. Have you ever seen a kid in timeout? Do you think they're sitting there pondering, maybe I shouldn't have done that? They're just sitting there and they feel like crap. Uh, imagine if you made a mistake at work and your boss said, go sit in the corner. You think about what you did. Wouldn't you just feel humiliated? It's the same thing. I hate it. Um, anyway, keep watching all my videos. I discuss everything else that you do instead. If they're three and over, use my behavior board. If they're under the age of three, it's consistent corrective actions. It's not words, none of these mini therapy sessions discussing all your feelings, their feelings. That's garbage. That was invented to make the mom feel good. It has nothing to do with the kids. You know when that came in? I called it the pleaser parent style. Do you know when that came in? It was about 40 years ago, and it came in with participation awards. Is that the stupidest thing you ever heard of? I just turn up and I get an award. Talk about raising self-entitled snowflakes with mental health issues. <laughs> so stupid. Oh my God, I couldn't believe it when I heard about that. Then everything else came in. Pleasing your kids, trying to make chores fun. Oh, heaven forbid, roll out the red carpet. Oh my God, that's oh, a disaster. Anyway, 